Fantastic. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this excellent conversation that we're about to have with um, David Abel. We are so excited at Headwaters to have um, been able to show Inundation District. Some of you might remember that we were able to show Entangled a couple of years ago and had a conversation with David about that. Um, and I expect uh, a similarly exciting and engaging conversation tonight. Um, this is a fantastic film uh, about the implications of Boston's decisions around their waterfront, waterfront district. Um, so let's get to it. Um, David, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself, introduce a little bit about the film and just um, how you got into the filmmaking and this topic. And then we have some uh, folks on board to ask questions. Great. Okay. Uh, Megan, thank you so much. And it's so nice uh, to be back with you guys and to have a chance to show another film. Uh, so I have been working on this film for the past few years. Um, I have been a reporter uh, at the Boston Globe for more years than I care to say at this point. And uh, over those years, I um, have written uh, uh, largely about climate change um, and uh, and other environmental issues. And, um, and over, I would say, uh, the past decade or so, there, I, I've experienced, I think, probably like a lot of people who live in in Boston, this peculiar cognitive dissonance. In that, uh, and it and it was pretty loud uh, kind of dissonance for for me as a climate reporter. In that, I had been covering report after report after report uh, about the threats of rising seas and. Each year, those reports seem to get worse. The estimates uh, seem to rise every year um, uh, to the point that uh, the most recent report, I think a year or two ago, uh, the worst case scenario was 50% worse uh, in terms of rising seas. I believe the estimate was more greater than 15 feet of potential sea rise uh, in the Northeast of the United States uh, by the end of this century. And, and, and the, the previous report uh, projecting uh, those rising seas suggested that the, the, um, that the worst case scenario would just be 10 feet. Um, and during uh, the course of these years of reporting, covering these reports, I was watching, like many people, this entirely new urban district being built at sea level, on landfill, hard on the coast, and in a city that has perhaps more climate scientists per capita than just about any other place on the planet, this new neighborhood was being built in the bullseye of rising seas, uh, which uh, you all learned about in uh, in the film, and I, and it was this cognitive dissonance that I had been wrestling with, and felt like it, it's hard, I think, to understand for a lot of people uh, the threats that we're really facing um, when we think about climate, uh, when we think about climate change, and we think about uh, particularly rising seas. Um, they seem distant, they seem abstract, and uh, and it's hard to understand what a few feet of sea level rise might mean. And so what I tried to do and what I, what I hoped to do with this film was to show how rising seas are not some distant abstract threat, but one that are one that is already affecting people today and one that is um, uh, going to uh, get significantly worse, uh, even if we go in the right direction of cutting emissions, uh, because there's already so much uh, carbon dioxide baked into the atmosphere, and we already have a good amount of warming uh, and sea level rise that is, is going to happen no matter what we do. And unfortunately, we're not going in the right direction, globally at least we're going in the wrong direction. Yeah, that's 
that's I remember that 50% um, increase that from the film um, when I was watching the other day and I was just, you know, in in one new report jumping up that much is is crazy. Yeah. Um, awesome. Well, uh, we have our our first um, question asker uh, who knows Boston well. <laughs> Donna, if you'd introduce yourself and ask your question. So thank you, David, for joining us. And, and my name is Donna Luisi, and I live and work a little bit north of Boston. I'm a board member on Headwaters, and I've been a pharmaceutical scientist for the last 20 plus years. And you're right, there's a lot of scientists in this area. Um, your film was terrific. So thank you very thank you. much. And one of the first questions that I have was from the city's perspective, right? They did exactly what they wanted to do. The focus was on creating jobs, uh, creating housing, economic growth, right? So it succeeded, but it completely ignored sea level rise. So money was the focus, right? We can all agree upon that, but what can we do moving forward to prevent something like this? Because it did sound like there were people who were trying to prevent the development, right? But that was ignored. So how do you move forward and help stop something like this from happening, not just in Boston, but there's so many cities just within the US that are at sea level already. Yeah, uh, all great questions. And yeah, let me just say that um, the focus on Boston Seaport was really just a prism to look at all kinds of uh, vulnerable coastal cities mm -hmm. where we are continuing to develop. Uh, what I th think distinguished this um, this uh, prism or this neighborhood from others is just that there are many vulnerable places um, on the planet, especially many vulnerable cities. Uh, but this city uh, decided to build this new neighborhood, investing billions of dollars um, when they knew about the threats of rising seas. Uh, and we are continuing to build there uh, uh, a pace. Every over the past two years, every time I have gone there, um, it, it it was like a new building had just sprung up. And um, uh, as far as what can be done, I mean, th there. Let me just back up and say that the the reality is that you know there there were good reasons to develop there. We spent. Uh, as a city um, and federally, uh, billions of dollars to clean up the uh, water all around this neighborhood. Uh, and I'm talking about Boston Harbor, which was once one of the most polluted harbors in the country. And, uh, and so once this harbor was cleaned up, there was suddenly interest in developing the, this area that was completely abandoned for, for nearly a century, I would say. Uh, for decades at the least. And um, it, the problem was that we just built without any real uh, thought about the dangers of rising seas. Uh, and for the most part, we're still doing that. Mm -hmm. And to, and to, to address the question that you asked, sorry, uh, just about sort of what we can do, I, I just think that going forward, it, it can't be an afterthought about uh, about addressing uh, rising seas and storm surge and other uh, impacts, uh, inland flooding uh, that comes from uh, a warming atmosphere. Uh, uh, we're going to see more torrential storms. Uh, we're going to see greater storm surge, all, all of these problems. And that has to be baked into any development plan. Um, and also, it has to be part of the costs, I would say, that are borne by the developers. I think the question that this film seeks to ask uh, is ultimately it, uh, what questions, the questions are about environmental or climate justice. Uh, in that who ultimately should foot the bill for uh, for first defending this new neighborhood uh, that was built uh, with a lot of public money, um, and then who should cover the costs of 
uh, bailing out this new neighborhood when the inevitable flooding comes. And, um, and I think that the answers to those questions uh, should come before such development happens. I agree. And I think, I, I think David, that ties really nicely into my second question was, I know right now there's always cranes down at the Seaport District, right? We, we know that more building, buildings are coming up. And I know that there's some new guidelines being put in place, right? I think it's like, you know, they have to protect the buildings for up to 40 inches of sea level rise. But is there significant pressure being placed to stop development? It seems like it's not right because we're always seeing cranes. We're always it's a, an incredibly expensive piece of property. They want to utilize it, but you know, are there more guidelines being put in place? Is there some pressure to stop building? Um, yeah. Maybe? So until a few years ago, there were absolutely no rules uh, mm -hmm. regarding uh, what height, uh, uh, what elevation building should happen. I think it was uh, two or three years ago that the city finally. Uh, 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 added some requirements for newly permitted buildings uh, to build above a certain elevation, um, but there has and there there has been so much that has already been permitted, and yeah. and uh, um, and the building you know is uh, there's so much that's already vulnerable, and I'm not quite sure how you. Uh, how how we're going to defend all of that real estate at this point um uh there are some designs and some ideas and some like very nice powerpoints uh out there about how we might uh ultimately protect uh this and other neighborhoods uh that um that are vulnerable to rising seas uh but no real actual uh efforts on the table uh uh that are that would you know protect this neighborhood and protect other neighborhoods in Boston from development and the and the reality is that there uh, is so much money behind this development that it it's Great. continuing. Uh, that all said, we do have a new administration that we show in the film uh, at the end of the film uh, that is taking these issues seriously and they you know have. Um, you know, they brought in new people and that those people are seriously looking at these issues, uh, but there, there's a lot of work to be done uh, and there are no simple solutions, frankly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Fantastic questions, Donna. Thank you so much. We have uh, Jack, another Headwaters board member to ask the next question. Hi, David. I'm Jack Holmes, a retired human ecologist from UC Davis and a Headwaters board member who mentors classes, our students occasionally, and uh, I'm very uh, much into the global warming paradox. Um, first, thank you. let me thank you for taking the topic. Humanity certainly needs more exposure on this issue. I agree with the commentary on the film. To make an impact, it needs to be emotionally relevant. My question is, is more in the order of your film and uh, its Im emotional impact on the audience. Uh, early in the film, a scholarly uh, concerned citizen makes the comment that developers skirt obligations on a routine basis, which is emotionally loaded and in an ethical sense. Later, you give considerable time to the de developers, I assume WD development. WS. Or sorry, WS development, apologist lines to the effect that we take seriously the science it's not our issue, it's worldwide, and affects many cities. We're considering the future of the city, the future of our kids, and we're doing many things to protect the investment from the predicted sea level rise. And then he makes the somewhat veiled excuse that all need to pitch in, which suggests to me that 
until the others pitch in that it is not really his ethical responsibility to take the foreseeable future very seriously. So I wonder why you hadn't reversed those two ideas, the skirting obligations and the taking science seriously, and come down much more heavily on the financial and ethical irresponsibility implied and largely demonstrated by the film as a whole, and perhaps documented some of the brilliantly or blatantly skirted obligations. Thank you again for making the film and making it available for early screening. Thanks, Jack. Um, and just to be clear, so your question is, why did I order the scenes in the way I did? Mm -hmm. um, and perhaps why did I give uh, so much say to the developer? Mm -hmm. So uh, my goal in the telling of this story is uh, uh, to weave together uh, different narratives. And my hope is that if I give everyone a fair shake and allow them an opportunity to say their piece, um, then uh, uh, I will give the viewers um, and also ask, be sure to ask the hard questions and not let anyone off the hook. Uh, my hope is uh, that that leaves it to the viewers to, uh, to decide. And so I, um, was very careful, very thoughtful about how I wanted to weave in uh, the different stories. And so uh, we, we start off the film um, uh, with the voice of someone who's m directly affected yeah. by the, uh, the rising seas. Uh, we, we see someone who is literally awaking, uh, oh, oh, awakens to a tide that is inches mm -hmm. from inundating him. Uh, and that person is sleeping on mm -hmm. a life raft. His, 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 um, his pillow is a, is an orange life preserver. And so I thought that it was really important to start with him and then come back to him again, uh, throughout the film to keep it real, to, to make it clear he's a stand-in in my eyes for uh, the fact that uh, climate change will affect the most vulnerable among us the most. And, uh, and he's a reflection of that. And, uh, and then I wanted to show the rising seas and, and what, uh, what they look like from uh, what's already happening in Boston Harbor when we have King Tides. Uh, and then uh, I wanted to give um, the developer his say and show the, the master developer of the neighborhood, give him the opportunity to make his case. Um, and I uh, filmed three scenes with him and, um, and I wanted people to see it from his point of view. Um, and then in the final scene with him, uh, uh, well, it's punctuated, as you mentioned, by a local activist who has been a long thorn in the side of that developer. And that local activist uh, is, is, is a kind of great rejoinder uh, to the developer. And he sort of uh, raises a lot of questions each in each, almost each time we come to the developer. So he offers a rebuttal, you could say, to the point of view of the developer. And at the very end, um, after we've gotten a chance to hear uh, the point of view of the developer, I, uh, I couldn't, I wouldn't, if, if it was my choice, I wouldn't have included my voice to have those questions in there. But it, it was really uh, hard not to do that. But I felt uh, like it had, these questions had to be answered. And, and I wanted to make clear uh, that these questions uh, demanded answers, and that's why I did that. Um, but we also show all kinds of other points of view in the film, from uh, from an artist's artist, and of course the scientists. Um, and uh, we did our best to weave those different points of view together and leave it up to the viewers 
to um, to make sense of it. As I said, thank you for for making the film. It uh, was well done. Thank you. Thanks, Jack. We have Sean uh, up next. He's got a couple of questions for you, or I think at least one. Yeah, let me just get the everything rolling here again. All right. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Well, I guess to reiterate, Jack, again, thank you again for for sharing your your artwork with us and and allowing us to watch this. Um, so it was a real pleasure, David. I, I greatly appreciate it. So my question, um, and, and forgive my bluntness. So the documentary kind of briefly touches on some green infrastructure changes. Um, and it, it didn't seem like it was a common discussion point with some of the people you talk to, right? There's a lot of gray infrastructure talk. Uh, and so I was kind of curious, so I have a two-part question to this, I guess, if you will, it kind of ties in. Why do you think that is? And is it something that like, have you noticed the city starting to kind of change uh, direction? So I, I work here at University of Florida and that's something, right? We're seeing down here is a lot of green change, a lot of living shoreline a lot of um, implementation of these types of practices. So I was just kind of curious as to like, since you're talking to everybody firsthand, um, what you, you know, what you see dealing with some of those people, just because I, you know, at the academic side, obviously, like we, we have a very biased <laughs> uh, viewpoint from what we get to see, so. Yeah, um, I mean, I think that there are um, only a few uh, viable ways that I'm aware of to protect um, a city that has uh, existed for 400 years uh, mm -hmm. that is all along the waterfront, uh, all along the coast at sea level um, and on landfill um, and hard on the coast. And, um, and you, you know, there are, I guess, sort of uh, coastal protections that could mm -hmm. be done. There could be, in the case of Boston, a harbor-wide barrier that could be done. And then there are uh, all kinds of uh, different ideas about, um, uh, like New York has just built uh, as part of its big U, uh, its effort to protect uh, the city, uh, uh, Lower Manhattan, they have um, created these, uh, this, I guess they're calling it like a living shoreline uh, or a park uh, that is meant to be inundated and absorb water. Um, and, it, you know, during most of the time, it will be, uh, you, you can play, I don't know, tennis and you can stroll and you can sit on, uh, um, lounge chairs in these new parks um uh but when it when it rains or when it when we have a major storm um and seas uh and tides rise and the sea levels rise that those parks will absorb some of the water and the the vegetation that's being planted in those areas are designed to be a resistant uh 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 to uh to salt water to be able to survive being underwater, uh, under seawater. And, and surely that is something that is being considered in Boston and that has to be part of the solution. Uh, the question is, is that enough? Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and do we need sort of uh, creative ideas to uh, like, is envisioned in the film with the so-called emerald necklace that might use sort of uh, natural barriers uh, that, and barrier isn't the right word, but these sort of like this vegetation uh, with yep. seagrass and eelgrass and all kinds of uh, uh, natural uh, uh, barriers that might dampen the impact of uh, storm surge, which is ultimately the most dangerous part of our future. Um, um, and then the question is, should we be doing something even more significant, like uh, building walls, uh, the so-called gray infrastructure that you're talking about, 
uh, that, uh, that I don't think anybody really wants to build. Uh, I don't, you know, uh, there, there, there are all kinds of, as the film touches on, potential ecological threats to, uh, uh, to building this so-called gray infrastructure. But mm -hmm. the reality is we are looking at a huge amount of sea level rise and we are looking at potentially really dangerous storm surge. And so uh, that has to be on the table, I think, as a potential solution to defend uh, a city that has, you know, presumably hundreds of billions of dollars at risk if there is a sandy style storm uh, that hits at the wrong time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. With roughly what is about, I think last time Noah said about 40% of the United States population is coastal, right? So it's not just a Boston problem, right? It's an everybody problem that's coastal. And so that's why I, I guess I'm, yeah, what you thought of as I guess as far as like the efficacy of having these kinds of talks, right? Building more green infrastructure as far as like making our cities more green with just a more of a proactive climate response, right? Like we look at green buildings, we see, you know, roofs going up as, as you know, reducing that UV, I guess, right? Coming down, right? That's one of our big, big issues with, uh, you know, letting off that UV, that extra right radiation and, you know, city warming, if you will. Yeah, and and no doubt. I mean, the the reason I made this film was to have conversations like this because it's it's obviously not just a problem in Boston. It's a problem in Florida. It's a problem, oh, yeah. uh, particularly in Florida. Uh, it's oh, yeah. a problem uh, uh, in every coastal uh, uh, city, and also inland cities have their own uh, dangers that they have to deal with. Um, but we do obviously need to be uh, redesigning and thinking uh, everywhere about new development and existing development. Cool. Well, yeah, thank you for that. I appreciate, like I said, I, I appreciate feeling the question because I kind of put you on the spot there. So I apologize for that. But I just, you know, it's curious to, like I said, <laughs> I, you know, being on one side of that talk, right? You know how it is just when you're at the university and that's all you see and hear is this, this, and this versus what is, you know, what's out, what's the civilian think? What is the, you know, what's the business yeah. person doing? Yeah. So it's, thank you. I have to say, I think maybe one, another reason I make these films is after, you know, being the questioner for so long, <laughs> <laughs> I, I get a dose of my own medicine. <laughs> Touche. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. Great. We have uh, another question. Um, I'm actually going to bring up Andy next and uh, go off of that solutions talk a little bit. Hi, David. I'm Andy Giordano. I'm a science teacher and school administrator here in Tahoe at um, Tahoe Expedition Academy. Um, and I was a founding board member of Headwaters many, many years ago. Um, so we were able to stream inundation district during our environmental science class over the last few days. And one of the measures I think of how effective a film is, is the quality of the discussion that you're able to have with with students afterwards. And um, our discussion was rich and at times even a little contentious, which is always fun. Um, and what I was think, contentious? I would love to hear that. Well, I, that's the nature of two of my questions. So, um, especially especially in a place like Tahoe. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, for sure. No, <laughs> it, well, you know, we we don't do great at showing up to things on time, but we ask good questions. <laughs> um, so, what was contentious was really. Um, Megan, I'm just going to bump them together. Okay. Um, I think for the first time in 18 years of teaching biology and environmental science, um, I heard from kids a little bit of doubt and a little bit of um, defeatism around like the long, the, the cause of rising sea levels around uh, the international community's ability to rally and meet the goals that they set around the timelines continually being pushed. And so while youth usually want to talk about things like climate change and what we can do to solve it and what can I do to solve it, um, this time the tone was a little different and there was more, more focus on uh, some of the solutions that you and Sean were just talking about and students wanted to know what is, is there a timeline? Is there 
you know, how long does it take to build a seawall? Is there any chance that there isn't major destruction before that happens? Um, we saw one Emerald Tutu, like how many, how many Emerald Tutus do we need to launch to dampen a, a serious swell? Uh, I remember watching the King Tides in Dennisport when I was growing up, lifeguarding and washing over the walls that were in place back in 1997. So it seems like it's all this is coming. Um, so a focus on like reactive solutions and what's the timeline for, for governments and for institutions to get these in place since clearly the cause is the, the cause of the, of this issue is slipping a little bit. Um, so the question is, is, uh, what is the <laughs> timeline? Or do you, do you see a timeline for, for mitigation or is it really just about let's stop building here and start, start changing our infrastructure? Yeah. Um, you know, I think the scene with the aquarium at the aquarium reflects, you know, uh, there is, I think she, the, the CEO of the aquarium, um, says, you know, we need to be doing something now. And, uh, there is not, uh, there's a, a ticking clock. I mean, you know, we can be affected by a major storm here any, at any moment. We just had in New England, uh, a massive series of storms in January. We had the fourth highest tides on record in, um, in uh, Boston in January, we saw massive damage all along the waterfronts of, uh, of New England, particularly in Maine. Um, we last year in 2023 had um, a record number of so-called billion dollar storms, storms in which the damage exceeded $1 billion. There were 28 of them in the United States and in 2023, that uh, exceeded the record of 22 in uh, in which was set uh, uh, three years before that, and the, that number is like a third higher than what was on average uh, in the 1990s. I mean, we're talking, we're we're seeing these impacts play out uh, um, all the time now, uh, and these are not, you know, far off. Uh, in the distance. So whatever solutions uh, we are going to we are going to develop, we need to start putting them in place now uh, or as soon as possible. But to to build, you know, if, if it turns out that a harbor wide barrier is a sensible thing to build, and I'm not advocating for that, and I, I don't know <laughs> uh, if it's wise. And there are a lot of really good arguments for why it is not a good thing to do, but if we were to decide to build that, um, there, was, there was a study that suggested it would cost something like $11 billion and take like 30 years to build. If we built a harbor-wide barrier, it would be the longest such barrier ever built anywhere in the world. Um, so, uh, and there are all kinds of questions, like how high do you have to build it? And we don't really know because we don't know how um, you know, how, how high the seas are going to rise. So there are all kinds of questions. There's all kinds of, um, uh, uh, expense that goes into these kinds of, uh, decisions. And, uh, and yet we don't have a lot of time left before we have to put these, uh, uh, solutions into, into place else we're going to see major damage. Got it. Thank you. Um, I'm going to pivot and introduce my students, um, Aiden Carpenter and Summer Lafleur. Uh, these are two of my seniors from Tahoe Expedition Academy who enjoyed screening the film and had some questions for you. Great. Nice to meet you guys, Summer and Aiden. Nice to meet you too. <laughs> um, thank you guys so much for doing this. This is so awesome. We absolutely loved your film. Thank you. <laughs> um, and I was wondering, as someone whose line of work is based around educating the public and showing how these issues that you're passionate about affect the lives of real people, um, what is one thing that you wish everyone knew about climate change and what their role is in this world on both an individual level and as a part of a community? 
Uh, that's a great question. Thank you for it. And I'm glad, I just want to say, I'm glad to hear, I was worried um, when I was making this film that it might seem like such a localized film that it, you know, wouldn't necessarily resonate with people in Lake Tahoe or <laughs> elsewhere, but I'm really glad to hear that it does um, because that was a, that was a pretty significant concern I had. Um, you know, I, I don't know uh, um, if I have a really great answer to your question uh, other than to say uh, people should know the facts. There is a tremendous amount of misinformation and disinformation out there. Uh, we have a potential president um, who still uh, calls climate change a hoax. Um, we have a we have a whole political party um, that is campaigning on um, on producing more fossil, developing or uh, generating more fossil fuels than we are already doing, and we are at the mo this very moment producing more um, um, uh, fossil fuels. Producing is probably not the right word, but um, uh, exporting and, um, uh, someone help me. What's the right word? Um, uh, extracting more fossil fuels, uh, from the earth than we have ever done before. And that has to stop. And, uh, we need to, we, we all are also at the same time, I think I just read in Texas of all places, um, the uh, this week, I think 85% of the energy that was being used in Texas was coming from wind and solar power. Um, and we are also thankfully ramping up this renewable energy at a rapid rate. And what people I think need to know is that there are solutions. Uh, there are ways that we can, uh, we can continue our way of life uh, without polluting our planet without essentially creating a nightmare for our children and future generations. Um, and while it's late in the game and while a lot of warming is still baked in, uh, we can avert the worst of the consequences if we move forward full speed ahead at trying to reduce the amount of fossil fuels we are pumping into the atmosphere. Um, and, um, uh, and that means, uh, you know, on an individual level, trying to reduce everyone's carbon footprint. Uh, uh, but it means thinking nationally, uh, collectively, uh, uh, nationally and globally. And, um, and, and ultimately, um, I think the answer to your question is that what we all have to be doing is thinking about who we are electing as our as our representatives as our political leaders who are uh essentially overseeing these huge investments and decisions um and if we continue to elect leaders who are calling climate change a hoax uh and that is not um and those issues are not foremost in people's minds when they are going to vote, then we are going to continue to see us going in the wrong direction. And what that means is more um, torrential storms, um, heat waves that are more deadly, um, rising seas, um, crop failure. It, you, you can go on and I don't want to uh, um, uh, add the gloom and doom too much here, but uh, ultimately get out and vote. And, and when you go out and vote, make sure the person, uh, the candidates that you're voting for uh, recognize that climate change is a uh, clear and present danger, not a distant abstract threat. That is fundamentally the most important thing you can do. That was awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I have one more question, and you kind of already touched on this 
a little bit, but um, have you noticed any patterns in the way that people respond to tough information presented to them? Meaning, do you, how do you navigate educating people when they don't want to see what's right in front of them or when the information is difficult to process? That's a great question again, and it's also really, um, really hard. Um, what I've tried to do with a lot of my films and maybe going back to answering, I think it was Jack's question about just why I wanted to include the voice of the developer in this film um, and give him ample say is I feel like if you bring in other sides and give them a fair shake um, and, uh, and show an openness to different points of view while also um, presenting the facts clearly and, and hopefully fearlessly, uh, uh, and in a, in a very straightforward way, uh, um, hopefully you can cut through all of that misinformation and disinformation and confusion and try to get people to see just what is already happening and what all uh, um, uh, signs suggest is going to happen. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hi, David. Uh, my name is Aiden. I'm a senior in high school. I'm from Lake Tahoe, California, which is a region known for its natural beauty, which is where I get my interest in, in environmental justice. Um, I have two questions. I'm going to college next year and I'm considering going into a law degree to further my interest in social justice. So I'm interested to know what kind of policy changes you think could have prevented the situation that Boston is in now, or what policy changes you think could redirect Boston from the trajectory that they're on now. Uh, thank you, and you are so lucky, Aiden, to live in such a beautiful part of the world. It is just a, a really magical place. And of course, you also have your own environmental uh, challenges there, uh, and um, and they're different than those that exist in Boston. Uh, but I'm glad to hear that you, uh, you have direction and you have a zeal uh, to to bring justice to the world. Uh, those are uh, very um, uh, powerful and noble imperatives. So uh, um, I'm uh, sending a lot of wind to fill your sails, I hope. Uh, but uh, ultimately, um, uh, I, I, I'm not a scientist. I'm not an engineer. Uh, I, I can't tell you, frankly, what the best solutions are to these problems. Uh, we need a robust debate. Uh, uh, we, we certainly suggest some potential ideas uh, for dealing with these problems. But the, the, the basic answer, I think, to your question is, as I suggested earlier, when we, we need to be mindful of short-sighted political decisions, we need to be mindful of um, profiteering at the expense of other people. We need to keep in mind uh, what climate or environmental justice means. Uh, and, that, and, and it means uh, not essentially uh, creating a problem that other people, uh, especially vulnerable people, lower income people, people of color, uh, are going to be left holding uh, the bag of all of these problems that other people are uh, are essentially uh, dumping on them, and we need to uh, ensure that we have policies and guidelines that protect us uh, from those sorts of uh, injustices, um, and. Ultimately, we need to be creating rules on a local, on a, a, on a, a statewide, on a regional and national and international stage that, uh, that uh, incent policies and decisions 
that reduce our use of fossil fuels uh, and require us to think about how we build and where we uh, site development uh, in ways that are not going to compound the problems uh, that we are already facing. I hope that that answers your question. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, and your talk about uh, different kinds of people leads to my next question, which is what was the significance of the range of people that you interviewed for the film? And how did the variety of people help you make your point? Um, yeah, I, I, I think I thank you for the question. I think I have addressed this to some extent already. I mean, my hope was that uh, by uh, bringing in a range of uh, points of view, point uh, different e expertise, uh, that it would cohere into a single narrative that would underscore uh, that we um, we need to act to address this global problem, and we need to understand that it's also very much a local problem uh, in coastal cities everywhere. Um, and so uh, that was my hope and goal by bringing in such a range of points of view. Okay, thank you, David. Thank you. Ed. Great questions um, from both of you. And uh, thank you so much, David, for answering those. Um, we have a question um, that came in through the chat. Um, are you seeing any discussion about how to accommodate the millions of folks who will de be displaced by sea level rise? Um, I think in the film, the aquarium might have been the only ones that actually mentioned needing to move or considering that as an option. Um, yeah, I think, um, especially for a place like the aquarium, the idea of retreat is, is, next to impossible. I mean, you know, you, you could have a, I think, I think the CEO of the aquarium says that, uh, you know, you could, if it was an art museum, it wouldn't be as hard, you know, to just pick up the artwork and move it to another building. Um, uh, an aquarium by, na by its nature has to be near the ocean. And that means they have to be um, able to pump large amounts of seawater every day at every hour in and out of the uh, of their tanks, and um, and yet they sit at sea level. Uh, just uh, in January, um, uh, when I was describing the fourth highest tides on record in Boston, that whole entire pier uh, where the aquarium is was inundated and uh and we actually had a screening of the film at the new england aquarium uh, a couple weeks ago and the folks there were showing me how the water entered their the theater where we were holding the the screening so it was uh it was definitely not hypothetical um there are there are going to have to be people who will retreat in lots of different areas. It doesn't make sense to continue to build in some places. Uh, we have this challenge. Um, we, we have this thing called the National Flood Insurance Program that is um, uh, in major debt and and it's backstopped by taxpayers and and uh, and we th th that. Uh, national insurance program is constantly um, paying to rebuild properties that have been destroyed by flooding. And we need to figure out how to change that system so that we're not constantly rebuilding these same properties that we know are going to be flooded even more going forward. So, um, so we have, we have, hard choices that we have to make. And uh, lots of people are gonna have to confront those choices. Uh, hopefully that answers the question. Yeah, thank you. Um, I have just uh, one or two more questions for you and it's kind of on the communication side of the film. Um, one of those is just, 
I, the number of times that someone used the word future was kind of, um, you know, kind of blew my mind because it, it is, you know, a lot of your imagery is this is actively happening right now. Um, and that was one of the other things that the CEO of the aquarium said was this is a, this is a now challenge. Um, it's not quite so much a, a future challenge. And um, I guess a, a lot of the folks at the beginning um, building construction planners and city planners were, you know, thinking about building for the future. Um, and so I was, uh, I don't know if that uh, was part of a plan for it, or just if that was something that you also noticed when you were doing all of your interviews. Uh, yeah, it, I don't know. Um, it's, it's an interesting observation. And, uh, and clearly, the, the film is looking forward uh, uh, in a lot of ways. And, and ultimately, it's a film that tries to make the future not seem distant and abstract. And, uh, and, um, and so I suppose that's why you hear that word so often. I was thinking about making a, a word cloud of the transcript and seeing how big uh, sea level and, and future were compared to each other. If you do that, I would love that. And we'd put it on our website. So if you can figure out how to do that. You might uh, have to send me the transcript first. I do but have then I the transcript. Do yeah, that's true. I, I, tell me how to make the word cloud and I'll, and I'll feed it in. <laughs> okay, awesome. Um, that you. does actually, my other question is on the graphic depictions and the data visualizations. Um, climate change is so complicated. The science is really complicated. The fact that a lot of what we're working with are models and predictions um, versus, you know, the all of the graphs are half observation and then half models and predictions. And, um, you know, we don't exactly know what's going to happen. You mentioned that before about we don't know how tall we need to build some of these barriers. Um, and we, uh, we shared the um, graphics from the Rising Seas page on the Inundation District um, site and just wanted to ask about, you know, your decisions on including graphs and, um, you know, the, the glacier visualizations. Um, I thought that those were really great ways to sort of illustrate this really complicated topic that was a little bit um, more tangential to the the point of the film. Um, what was tangential to the point of the film? Just you weren't explaining the science of climate change and you know all of that, um, but you made sure that that science was in there and accessible. Yeah, no, I mean, I we we had to address that. That's obviously a critical part of the film, and we do have a few climate scientists in the film who, you know try to explain it in basic ways um, uh, without getting too deeply into the weeds. Um, but my hope was, I think, as I, as I mentioned in, in answer to one of the previous questions, you know, there's a lot of hopefully compelling um, and uh, beautiful imagery that lures you in, but you have to sort of weave that together with the facts and, uh, and the facts uh, include just, you know, how much seas have already risen, how they're rising disproportionately in the Northeast, uh, uh, how, uh, how we are getting uh, increasing amounts of heavy precipitation and what has already happened, and then what the best uh, uh, predictions suggest for the future. So. Uh, you need a little spinach, uh, I guess, uh, with your uh, with your sugar, if that's an expression I just coined. I don't know. Of course, I like it. <laughs> um, I'd love to. I, I like to end our conversations always uh, asking anyone that I talk to about their reasons for hope. What makes you optimistic? You know, a lot of the films that you are doing from entangled through, you know, this one, whether it's uh, animals or other species um, or climate change and people uh, often seem like big, you know, we, I'm sure in, in Boston, you definitely call them wicked problems. Um, but what, what makes you optimistic about, about all of this? Yeah. Um, so, well, let me just, 
evade that question by just uh, 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 one aside, which is I just uh, had this rare uh, uh, um, thing happen where it, in addition to bringing this film, Inundation District, into the world, we brought another film into the world called In the Whale. Uh, and this film is all about, uh, I think, you know, it is a sort of, is a survival story and is about a triumph of the spirit on some levels. Um, uh, and it's about, you know, it, it, it's about a, a lobster diver, a commercial lobster diver who was swallowed by a humpback whale and lived to tell the tale. And, uh, and so um, I'm not always dour, although there are quite a few dour moments in that film uh, to say the least. Um, but, um, the first thing I would say is that I, I, I don't think it's the job of a filmmaker to be sunny um, and to always have a pat answer. And people are constantly asking that question, what gives me hope? And, um, and, and our job is not to just make people feel comfortable or good or like everything's going to just turn out to be fine. The reality is that uh, um, in order to avoid the worst consequences of climate change, um, we need to cut our emissions globally roughly by half by the end of this century, by the end of this decade, excuse me, um, and effectively eliminate them by mid century. And as we note in that very sunny ending of the film, uh, that we are going in the wrong direction. We're actually not cutting emissions. We're continuing to uh, uh, increase them. And that's a big problem. And so there's no real um, uh, happy, warm and fuzzy way of, uh, uh, of packaging that problem. Um, however, we are an ingenious species. We, um, in the last few years, did something that was previously considered impossible, crazy, unrealistic. We developed, we used this radically new technology called mRNA to create these new vaccines that we were, we were able within a year of this horrific pandemic that sweeped around the globe, we were able to develop these vaccines and distribute them to billions of people and save millions of lives, despite all the misinformation and disinformation about them. That to me is a reflection that when we concentrate our minds on trying to solve seemingly impossible problem, we can do that. And we know what we need to do. And the political problems are the things that make me the most pessimistic. But what gives me optimism and hope is that we have a lot of really smart people thinking about really creative solutions and new technologies and, and to be concrete. And I've said this uh, before, uh, and have written about this uh, quite a bit for the newspaper, um, there have been developments just in the past few years about nuclear fusion that give me great hope. It could be a thin read of hope, uh, uh, but we have shown that we can harness the power of stars and that we can translate that power into energy. And there are now companies that are spending billions of dollars and backed by governments around the world, um, actively trying to produce commercial reactors that could produce a terrific amount of energy with effectively no, no emissions. And, um, and if we can do something like that, and the hope is that you know, by the end of this decade, we could actually see uh, commercial reactors producing um, this kind of energy. 
we could we could turn you know this conversation around and things could hopefully uh, uh, have a much better ending than uh, we envision in inundation district. And that's what I'm hoping for. <laughs> I love that. That's great. Um, David, thank you so much for joining us. This was fantastic. And thanks to all of our uh, panelists who came and asked fantastic questions as well. Um, I hope everyone enjoyed the film. Um, and if you would like, let me pull up the link. Um, you can find all of the other screenings and other conversations that David's going to be doing uh, as it continues to travel around, I'm sure, um, there at inundationdistrict.com. Thank you so much uh, for hosting this, Megan. Thank you uh, to everyone there uh, and everyone who asked great questions. Uh, it was really a pleasure. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much again. And uh, thanks to everyone who joined us and uh, is uh, watching either online live now or is watching the recording of this. Um, Headwaters is so thankful for this community and all of our folks who are so interested and passionate about science, um, the process of science, uh, topics like climate change and sea level rise, and all of our students that are uh, coming through Headwaters programs and having that curiosity and hopefully they'll be the ones that go out there and make fusion happen. <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay. Good night. Bye.